It's tempting for us at times to think that the world is a violent and conflicted one beyond our shores, but to forget the extent of the violence and conflict and sorrow related to those dynamics within our own history and within our own shores. In fact, the history of Australia is a history that's soaked in blood and violence, even though we don't talk about it enough or truthfully as we should. When we think about the violence that our Indigenous brothers and sisters have suffered over the last couple of hundred years, the way in which they are overrepresented in incarceration, in our prisons, the terrible suffering of our Indigenous brothers and sisters, not only historically but continually. When we think about the numbers of children that were locked up for so many years in offshore detention, children who had come from situations of terrible violence and conflict only to be um, to to be to suffer further through this offshore detention, another form of, in, of violence meted out against them. When we think about what's been revealed in the last couple of weeks about the violence against women, even in uh, our political institutions, we are living in a time that doesn't just know violence on a global scale or violence in other contexts, but we are living in our, our context ourselves that has known its own share of violence and conflict and bloodshed. I've taken to going to social media a lot less in recent times because social media isn't a peaceable place, in case you haven't noticed. You know, it feels like we are in a world that encourages polarisation, conflict, disagreement and violence. What does it mean for God's people to be peacemakers? Jesus came into a context where he said, blessed are the peacemakers for they will be called children of God. I've had the opportunity a number of times to spend some time in Israel and Palestine and Jordan. Twice I had the, the opportunity to kind of spend exp extended time in Palestine. And when you spend some time in Palestine, the reality of the, of the conflicted, violent situation that Jesus was speaking to becomes real for you. Um, you know, I uh, remember spending an, a, a, some time working with a humanitarian organisation in the Palestinian territories. And then when we came out of the Palestinian territories and we went to the, uh, the airport to fly back to Australia, a friend of ours, a young lady who'd been working with and serving with us, happened to mention to the Israeli soldiers that we'd spent that time working in the Palestinian territories. Um, and they took her into a room. Uh, we didn't see her for about four hours and we missed our flights. We were very worried for her. And when she came out of the room, she was visibly shaken. Her, her face was puffed up from, from sobbing. And she re relayed to us the fact that she'd been taken into a room. She'd been stripped down to her underwear. She'd been kept in isolation. She'd been searched and interrogated and humiliated and violence had been meted out against her all because she had spent a number of weeks working in the Palestinian territories in order to bring aid and development and reconciliation. This is not to say that the Israelis are the only persons that are meeting out violence in that area of the world. As we know, the Palestinians themselves have been, have been a part of their own violence and we stayed in areas where you would sleep at night and you would hear the rockets flying over your head into the Israeli territories and then back over in the other direction. But it was into that context of violence, hatred, religious, political, social, cultural, gender violence that Jesus said, blessed are the peacemakers. N.T. Wright articulates the ways in which the Jews, 
suffering political oppression and violence in the first century only had a few, a, a small number of options that were available to them. Either they would become Essenes or some other religious order that would retreat out into the deserts of Palestine to escape the violence, join a religious or, or other sort of community out in the wilderness to escape the violence and oppression. So what do you do? Do you escape the violence? Do you retreat from the world? Do you pretend like it's not happening? Or the other option was to become zealots. Now, the zealots were those who put a, a sword or a knife under their cloak, and whenever they could, they would sneak up behind a Roman officer and they would slip a knife under the Roman officer's rib cage. See, do you choose the way of retreat in the face of violence? Do you choose the way of violence in the face of violence? Or you would become a tax collector, you know, a collaborator, one who would cooperate with the, with the occupying forces in order to enjoy the benefits of cooperating with the violence that was being meted out against your own people. In other words, you become a perpetrator of violence in order to benefit from the violence that is going on around you. The Jews in the time of Jesus only had a small number of options. Retreat from the violence and run away. Collaborate with those who are meeting out violence against your own people. Or take up a sword. Fight back. Become a person of violence yourself. And N.T. Wright says, into that context of violence where there are a small number of options available to you, Jesus says, let me show you another way. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called the children of God. Blessed are the peacemakers. And Jesus comes to us in a broken, conflicted, polarized, violent world and says, blessed are the peacemakers. Peacemaking is our virtue. It's our vocation. You know, the old word, the old Latin word, vocation. Peacemaking is our, just means that it's our call. God comes to us and gives us a powerful, world-changing call to be peacemakers in a violent, polarized world of great suffering. In the Sermon on the Mount, this is what Jesus says. He says, blessed are the peacemakers. And then in the Beatitudes, he begins to describe to us what does peacemaking look like? He says that peacemakers see God. They inherit the kingdom of God. They are called the children of God. Peacemakers, when they engage in peacemaking in a way that brings justice and love and peace to a broken world, they do so in a way that shows that they are the children of God in humility, righteousness, meekness, and peaceableness. Dallas Willard says that we make a mistake when we look at the Beatitudes and we think of them as merely virtues. You know, these high virtues that none of us are able to achieve. Dallas Willard says, actually, they're not just virtues. They're Jesus' way of turning the values and the perspectives of the world on their head. Jesus inverts the way of the world. And he says, blessed are those who hunger and thirst. Blessed are those who suffer. Blessed are the peacemakers. The world says, Blessed are the powerful, the strong. Blessed are the rich. Blessed are the knowledgeable. Blessed are the articulate. Blessed are those who have elite cultural and religious or gendered power. Jesus says no. He inverts the way of the world and says, Blessed are 
are those who are weak and poor and broken and vulnerable. Blessed are those who are despised by society. Blessed are those who are despised by the religious establishment. Unless your righteousness is greater than the Pharisees, than the pastors, than the theologians, unless your righteousness is greater, you will not know the kingdom of heaven. What Jesus does in the Beatitudes in the Sermon on the Mount is that he inverts status. Status is reverted in the kingdom of heaven. And he says the ways of God, the goodness of God, the righteousness of God is revealed amongst the despised in the most unlikely places, amongst the most unlikely people. The Samaritan, the prostitute, the tax collector, the broken, the wounded, the inarticulate, that's where God is revealed. Even amongst the peacemakers. Jesus brings this message into a world that does not honour the peacemaker. What does the world do to peacemakers? It marginalises them, it ignores them, it humiliates them, it murders them. Only look and see what it did to Jesus Christ to see what happens when you become a peacemaker. But Jesus doesn't say, be peaceable. He says, be peacemaking. We have this idea that peacemaking is a sign of weakness, that it's kind of a way of compromising rather than taking a stand. Sometimes we think that peacemaking is keeping the peace at all costs or choosing not to rock the boat. Well, look at the life of Jesus. Jesus was a boat rocker, if there's such a thing. Jesus didn't keep the peace at all costs. In fact, what Jesus showed us is that peacemaking often involves stirring up conflict. A certain kind of righteous, holy, just conflict comes with being a peacemaker. You can't have peace without justice. If you can't have peace without justice, you can't have peacemaking without some stirring up of conflict. But what Jesus showed us is that peacemaking is about integrity, holiness, justice, and love. It's not conflict for conflict's sake. It's not keeping the peace at all costs. It's a holy, righteous, proactive, hands-on, purposeful peacemaking that God showed us and God calls us to. God is peace. Be a peacemaker. God is love. Live a life of love. God is just. Be a person of justice. The second thing we notice is that reconciliation is our ministry. If you want to know what it means to be a peacemaker, look at the Sermon on the Mount. Look at the Beatitudes. Jesus shows us in the Sermon on the Mount what peacemakers are like. They seek reconciliation and put aside anger, revenge and judgmentalism. They reject violence and offence and exploitations. They turn the other cheek and love their enemies. They choose the way of prayer, not only for those that they love, not only what, for what's good for them, but pray, praying for those who hate them, who speak ill of them, who seek their demise. They pray for those who are violent towards them. Jesus shows us in the Sermon on the Mount what it means to follow the Prince of Peace, the Prince of Peace who calls us to be people of peace. And then Paul goes on saying, picking up on this idea from Jesus in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, all this is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of peacemaking, the ministry of reconciliation, that God was reconciling himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against them. 
He committed to us the ministry of reconciliation. I love the way that Brenda Salter McNeil talks about what reconciliation is about. She says that reconciliation is this ongoing spiritual process involving forgiveness, repentance, and justice that restores broken relationships, addresses unjust systems, heals broken relationships and reflects God's original intention for the flourishing of all creation and all people. What does it mean to be, or what motivates us to be reconcilers and peacemakers? In 2 Corinthians 5, Paul says that Christ's love compels us because we are convinced that one died for all and therefore all died. He died for all that we might no longer live for ourselves, but we might live for the one who died and gave his life for all. This is what motivates us to be reconcilers, to be peacemakers. Jesus shows us that forgiveness is our obligation. Forgiveness is our obligation. Peacemakers are those who embrace the way of forgiveness. You know, many of us like to talk about peace. We like to talk about reconciliation and yet we hold or we harbour inner resentments, anger towards those who've wounded us. And the people that are hardest to forgive are the people who were once close to us. I find it easy to forgive the abstract, distant, faceless enemy. I find it much harder to forgive the person who has become my enemy who I once broke bread with, who shared a meal in my home, who worshipped with me on a Sunday, but then became my enemy, spoke ill of me, stabbed me in the back. The brother who became the enemy, the sister who became the enemy, is the hardest person to forgive. I find that, I I think that's human nature. I feel hurt, betrayed. I feel like my anger towards that person is just and justified. Jesus says, love your enemy, even the enemy that you once knew deeply and betrayed you. Love your enemy. And Jesus says forgiveness is like peacemaking. It's the, it's the thing that distinguishes disciples, that sets them apart from others. And so Jesus goes on and says, you know, you've heard uh, it said an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. Well, let me tell you, that isn't the way of the kingdom of God. Love. Forgive, go the extra mile, turn the other cheek, pray for your enemies. These are extraordinary words in a broken, conflicted world. Matthew 18, 15 to 23, Jesus says that forgiveness and peace are not the same as the absence of conflict. In fact, as I've said, that when we are people who desire the truth, when we are people who yearn for light in dark places, when we are people who call others to repentance, when we are people who expose injustice, when we are people who do all of that, we are often people who disagree vigorously, who refuse to be silent, who speak against hatred and enmity and injustice with great passion. We are people who demand truth-telling and who call for a renovation of the heart. When we do all of that, we must be people who do it with love and yet a call for justice. With forgiveness and yet an unwillingness to bend or compromise in the face of 
of hatred and injustices. I think we are called to be people who speak truth and justice, but do so in a way that is soaked in love, that is soaked in grace, that recognises our own failings, our own participation in injustice, our own compromises, our own acquiescence to the ways and the brokenness of the world. It's impossible to call others with great passion to justice and to telling the truth and to change in a way that honours God unless we recognise our own brokenness, our own sin, our own participation in injustice, our own participation in the systems that have caused others to suffer injustice. And that's my long-winded way of saying, I don't think we can call others to change in a way that really honours God until we recognise our own brokenness. True, a true call to justice comes from the lips of somebody who doesn't hate their enemy, who doesn't do it self-righteously, who doesn't stand up from a pulpit. You know, Spurgeon once said that pul pulpits are cowards' castles. You know, Paul, St Spurgeon, the greatest preacher who probably the, the world has ever known, said, I'm not crazy about pulpits because pulpits are cowards' castles. And what Spurgeon was saying is it's easier to preach at others from a position of righteousness. It's much harder to get down in the dirt and the muck and the mire and to admit that you are broken, that you've done the wrong thing, that your call for justice and peace comes out of your own participation and complicity in the injustices, in the violence. Jesus says, forgiveness is our obligation. Forgive. Not seven times, but 70 times seven. From your heart. Then Jesus says that non violence is our lifestyle. Jesus is a peacemaking Lord, and it's easy for us to kind of go and look at the Old Testament and say, but the Old Testament God was a violent God. God does violence, but his violence is righteous anger and judgment. It's impossible for human beings to do just and righteous violence. It's entirely impossible. It may be possible for God, but it isn't possible for you and for me. Jesus shows us that while God knows a holy, just wrath, his dream for humanity is peace and nonviolence. His call to the church is to be a people who pursue a lifestyle of peace and nonviolence. Turn the other cheek, be merciful. Pursue peace. Forgive those who have wronged you. Love indiscriminately. Choose the way of the cross. Sacrifice yourself. Jesus Christ, the God of Christians, is a strange, bizarre, confronting, offensive God. It's hard for us as Christians to understand sometimes just how bizarre and offensive the Christian God is. The Roman world knew nothing of this God, the God of the cross, who bled, was wounded, and suffered, and sacrificed, and gave himself away, who said, love your enemies. Don't do violence towards them. Do not condemn. Do not hate. Do not repay evil with evil, but love. Go the extra mile. Do not curse. Overcome evil with good and sow seeds of peace. Then people will look at you and say, these indeed are children of God. Persecution is our heritage. It's not coincidental that Jesus said, blessed are the peacemakers, blessed are the peacemakers, and blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake. Because peacemaking and persecution go hand in hand. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those when people insult you, persecute you, 
say all kinds of evil against you, false evil. Rejoice and be glad, for great is your reward in heaven. For in the same way, they persecuted the prophets before you. If the people of God throughout millennia have suffered and been persecuted, have had the skin ripped from their bodies, have been flailed, have had their husbands and wives and children ripped from them, have been nailed to crosses. If the people of God throughout millennia have been persecuted, what makes us think that our lot is going to be any different? What makes us think that we shouldn't suffer? I uh, once was, had the opportunity of spending some time speaking at a conference in Manila, and uh, this conference gathered Christians from all over the Asia-Pacific, and I said to my wife, because I want to save a little bit of money, can I stay at a backpacker's hostel? And she said, whatever, uh, whatever floats your boat. She knows what I'm like. So I stayed at a backpacker's hostel in Manila um, and had this opportunity to spend time with thousands of Christians gathered from all across the Asia Pacific talking about discipleship and mission. It was a life-changing experience. But one morning I was woken up to the sound of sobbing. And I looked down over my bunk and I saw this elderly man kneeling down beside the bed, weeping and sobbing, his whole body shaking. And I got to know him over the course of the week. He was an elderly Vietnamese pastor. And he told me, he would, every morning he'd get up and he would pray for the Church of Vietnam and sob and weep over an open Bible. And he told me the story of how 30 years earlier he'd planted a church in his home of 10 people. And over the course of about 40 years or so, it had grown to somewhere like 30, 35,000 people meeting in homes across communist Vietnam. And he told me about the, it sounded like the, the story of the early church. He told me that he was one of four brothers. Each of them had become pastors in this church planting movement. Three of his brothers, their families had received a knock on the door one night. They'd been taken away and they'd never been seen again. He told me a story of beatings, imprisonments, persecution, sufferings, and yet a story of renewal and growth and dynamism of a a church that grew from 10 people to 35,000 people under great suffering. In the middle of that suffering, mission and discipleship and life occurred. The church is often at its best when it is marginal, when it's persecuted, when it's misunderstood, mischaracterized, hunted down, that's often when the church is at its best. We fear the marginalization of the church and there are some terrible things that come with it. And yet that's when the church can shine and be a remarkable witness. A number of years ago, as I said, I got to spend some time in Palestine and I I went to the Tent of Nations The Tent of Nations is a couple of kilometres outside of the city of Bethlehem in the Palestinian territories. And the the Tent of Nations is this farm um, that has been developed by the Nassars. The Nassars are Palestinian Christians. And their family have lived on this farm for a thousand years, since the time of the Ottoman Empire. In fact, they've got documents, thousand-year-old documents that were signed during the period of the Ottoman Empire, giving the land over to their ancestors. And the Nassars, their, their families lived in, in caves in this land. So you would go, you go to the Tent of Nations and you go into the caves. And one of the caves that I went to, into, uh, that I met with Amal, is probably about two-thirds the size of this building. And when you walk into the cave, there's all these beautiful paintings all around the walls in about, you know, maybe 60 languages that say, in 60 languages it says, we refuse to be enemies. Because the Nassars have opened up their land as a, as a place for healing and reconciliation. They invite Muslims and Jews and Christians, Germans and Jews and Australians and Americans. They invite people from all over the world to come to their farm to spend time together praying and and reading and planting olive trees and committing themselves to going out into the world and being a people of peacemaking and to painting We Refuse to Be Enemies. 
in different languages all around the walls. It's, a, it's such a moving experience for me going to the Tent of Nations. She told me stories of how the Israelis would bring in these bulldozers and rip up their 100-year-old olive trees and they would replant them and they would, they would stand in around singing songs saying, we refuse, these Palestinian Christians, hand in hand with uh, Israelis, with Jews, saying we refuse to be enemies. She told me one story about one day she saw this. This woman was jogging past her home and uh, the woman stopped and looked at her and said, the woman was from an Israeli settlement on Palestinian land. She, uh, she stopped and she said, what are you doing here in the middle of nowhere? And Amal said, well, this is my farm. She said, what do you mean this is your farm? Nobody lives here. This is deserted land. And Amal said, no, my family's lived here for a thousand years. She said, but there are no roads, there are no houses, where do you live? And she said, well, actually we live in the caves. We've built homes and there's a whole cave system here where we've we've built homes. She said, that can't be the case. My husband and my family told me there's nobody on this land. She said, no, actually there are thousands of people who've lived in this this land for generations. They got, they become friends and they shared meals together. And she told this wonderful story about one day, um, her name was Maya. Maya is the Israeli settler. She told a story about one day Maya's uh, child uh, was turning 10 and she wanted to have a birthday party. And Amal said, why don't you come and have the birthday party in, on our land, in, in our cave? So Maya agreed. Her husband wasn't so happy, but eventually agreed. And they came and had this wonderful celebration of Palestinian and Israeli children, um, Muslims, Jews and Christians celebrating together this wonderful symbol of reconciliation and hope in the, uh, in the holy land of Israel. Palestinian Christians are showing us what it means to be a people of peacemaking and hope in a broken, wounded world. And that's what we're called to be as well. I want to leave you with a prayer of peace, a prayer for peace. Uh, this is a prayer that I wrote in recent times as an adaption of a prayer by Yared the Ethiopian, written in 505 um, um, AD. An adaption of the prayer of uh, Yared the Ethiopian Christian in 505. It says these words, Lord Jesus, lead us together to your cross. The cross is the way of the loss. The cross is the support of those who stumble. The cross is the guide of the blind. The cross is the strength of the weak. The cross is the hope of the hopeless, the freedom of the enslaved, the water of the seeds. The cross is the consolation of the suffering, the voice of the voiceless, the source of those who seek water the cloth of the naked, the faith of the doubter, the solution to personal and collective sin. The cross is the offer of welcome and embrace for the excluded. Lord Jesus, lead us together to your cross. And just a concluding reflection as a form of benediction as we close. The world suffers under racial religious, gender, political and other conflicts and divisions. But Jesus says, blessed are the peacemakers. Peacemaking is our virtue, our call and vocation. Reconciliation is our mission, message and ministry. Forgiveness is our freedom and obligation. Nonviolence is our way of life. Persecution is our heritage. Peacemaking takes imagination and humility and courage. The peacemaking church sows in peace and reaps a harvest of righteousness. Amen.